G'day everybody and those for those who have come in late, you're listening to Expand the Phantom Cast. Today we've got something a little bit different. Uh, my name is Jermaine and I am very happy to announce that we have the whole team today. Stephen and Dan, how are you guys going? Excellent. I'm excellent. I'm very well, thank you. So, listeners, don't adjust your headsets. You ha- you have read the name of this uh, podcast correctly, and yes, you're listening to my voice. <laughs> and we've got not just one special guest, but we've got two special guests, and three if you include Stephen. <laughs> uh, so, uh, first of all, a quick thank thanks to our sponsor, uh, Kaboom Comics in Toowoomba. Um, if you're around southeast Queensland, get in there, say hello. Uh, you know, they can be great in helping you get comics and stuff like that. Um, that's all the introductions kind of over and done with. Uh, let's get straight into it because I am very looking forward to, to uh, today's podcast. So what we're doing is we've, we're catching up with not one, but two from the creator team on... The Daily Story 249, titled A Reckoning with the Nomad. Now, uh, so we've got the author, Tony D. Paul and Mike Manley, the artist. How are you guys going? Good. Doing well. Glad to be here. That's good. Now, we're very excited to talk this story with you. Uh, before we get too much further, we do need to say that there is going to be a spoiler alert. Uh, when this is released, uh, the story, the last panel or the last day of the story has just been released uh, around the world. However, we've been lucky enough to get a sneak peek. So we will be talking about the whole story. So if you are waiting for the story to hit a free comic or an Egmont comic, you may want to go to Comics Kingdom and give it a bit of a read. Um, you will not be disappointed. Uh, and everything we will be discussing is assuming that you, the listener, have already read it. All right, so let's get into the questions. Now, um, Stephen, I'm gonna, do you, have, you want to fire off a couple of questions and we'll just go from there? Um, well, I thought I might just start with it um, overall rather than a, a, a question. Yeah, right, maybe, right. maybe, there'll be a, maybe there'll be a question in there somewhere. Um, uh, first of all, Thanks for uh, coming on the podcast. It's been great emailing you um, over the last little while. I did get a chance to speak to Mike a little while ago for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, but um, great to finally hear your voice in person there, Tony. Well, it's, I'm glad you're here. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, always a pleasure. Um, now, get, getting a chance to uh, rereading the story um, just in the past week, um, it was good to go back to the start of the story and, and see things that are kind of forgotten and mm. um, and see how they tie up at, at the end of the story. And something that um, really got me was, I call it book ending. There's probably some other um, fancy word for it. But I like at the, at the start of the story how um, Heloise is very confident. She's not homesick. She she loves being in, in New York or, and um, loves her life over there in the States. But at the and yeah, saying that she's not homesick. Then at the end of the story, I want to go home. You know, she's. Um, I just thought I, I didn't realise that at the time until I went back and um, reread the story and said, "Oh, yeah, right." The story right at the start, she says, um, "You know how good it is to be here, not homesick at all." Then at the end, she's longing for home. Was that a um, was that something you, you set out to do at the at the get go, or was that um, just happened to turn out that way? Uh, no, no, that was exactly the uh, the plan, and the synopsis for this story has been in the can for three years now. Oh, wow. Uh, it was approved in, I want to say, December of 2015, and that's, so that's three years and two editors ago. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. It was Brendan Burford who approved this story synopsis, and uh, no, that, that was always the, the idea that uh, we wanted to show that there's a real uh, cost to Heloise on this yeah. encounter with the nomad. I mean, basically, yeah. her her entire uh, education plan for her young adulthood uh, it it's blown up on her. You know, there's really yeah. no going back to the school. Uh, next, but yep. uh, it, it, clearly, she can't go back to the Bryerson School. 
Mm. So, in so why would you not put it back to the Bryson School? Is it because of uh, Cardia, the Nomad's daughter, or is it just kind of like that chapter's finished and let's move on to a new one? Yeah, well, her her identity is known to the uh, the authorities. Yeah, uh, I mean they'll they'll be after her there. So uh, the t- <laughs> the two feds who come to pick up the nomad, uh, they'll be very interested in talking to her, even though their instructions to the airport police were that this girl doesn't exist. There's yeah. no footage of uh, there's no footage of the foot chase. And um, but they're going to be interested in in talking. To her, yeah, so. of course. Now, of Tony, course. Tony, just as you mentioned, the, the two feds who, um, uh, who who gave that instruction, I read a uh, uh, today as we're recording is the day that uh, they appeared in the in, in the daily strip. And uh, I read a comment, a conspiracy theory, if you will, on Facebook. So, uh, <laughs> so I've got to ask it. Um, that uh, they may well be the nomads' men who have actually uh, decided to to rescue him, and this is how he's he, this is how he's going to get out. Is there is there that possibility? No. <laughs> I was thinking that too. I'm, I'm glad that's the, I'm glad that's the case. The feds have so. So is this the end of the nomad? Oh no, no. I mean, he's you know he's alive and okay. sort of he's uh, sort of in the same position as Ethan. He's he may be back at some point. Okay. Mike, does that excite you to hear that the Nomad may be back again? Because I, I get the feeling you really quite enjoyed drawing him. His, his evil little eyes and the, the shadow that goes across him as he uh, has his dark thoughts and that sort of thing. Uh, would you be excited to see the Nomad come back? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's again, that's part of, of all of the sort of genre fiction. I mean, any arch nemesis is never truly dead um yeah you know i mean how many times has the joker been blown up or you know you think that he's dead or he gets eaten by a shark or something and then he just shows up later or dr doom or you know um uh if you eliminate all the really cool uh villains and the then the uh uh the phantom would have like no you know, no arch nemesis. That'd be good, kind of boring. You'd have to keep, keep picking up like new awesome villains all the time. But you, you raise a brilliant point there, Mike. Um, there hasn't been many arch villains that keep coming back. Um, we recently did a, a poll on uh, like the fans, you know, favorite villains. Uh, the Nomad and uh, the Python were very high, but it, what was actually interesting is having a look at the, the villains that made the list. A lot of the villains have only ever been in a couple of stories and, and you raise villains like the Joker and Doctor Doom where it's like almost every second story is featuring these same guys. So is there room for um, the Python, uh, the Nomad and uh, the Sing Brotherhood and some of these other guys to make more of a, a return in Phantom stories? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly think so. And even, uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, Savarna will be back at some point. And she's oh, not a villain, but she's sort of, uh, she's not an quite anti-hero. a hero. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, there's probably a lot of room to create um, characters um, along the same, or along similar lines, I should say. Yeah. Uh, I think I you're probably thought- seeing that. I always thought that was a strength of the Phantom. He's not always battling the same person. There's a variety there. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, yeah. in the in the Falk era, it was typically uh, most of the guys were kind of low-level thugs, uh, smugglers and pirates that you never saw again. Um, but, yeah, no, I think uh, I agree with Mike entirely. There should be uh, recurring villains that uh, he can't quite – defeat he can he can thwart them and obstruct their plans but they'll be back someday mm. well he, he's done a brilliant job of um dealing with the nomad at this point by the time um you know in the battlements of the nomad you uh, had him steal that really important hard drive which has given uh, authorities around the world the opportunity to, to mop up 
the various um, cells that the nomads created around the world, which I think is, uh, was done re really, really cleverly. And then you could sense that, that pressure that was coming to bear on the nomad. Um, in the, the scene in the, um, yeah, I'm getting, I did write down the dates of it, but uh, where, where he decides that he's got to get rid of Heloise, you can just sense the pressure that's coming on him that the, the the walls are closing in and he's got to he's got to try and tidy up this last loose end and um and then make a disappearance um so he's you know his network around the world is gone and now he's in prison um the phantom's done a very good job of um of closing him down at this point it's going to be a big effort for the nomad to come back yeah yeah i, I agree <clears throat> and um uh... You know, it was also an exercise in delayed gratification for the Phantom because I mean, it's pretty hard to walk away from the fight and not mm. not get the guy, mm. you know, and think, okay, I've got to wait yeah. a year or a half a year or whatever it is. Um, and that's and then, not you know, something that's not something we always see with the Phantom. It's always you know, it goes in, cleans up the mess, and that's the end of the story and the end of the bad guy. So it's definitely a uh, like almost a new trend that we've seen with, you know, someone like the Nomad where it's, you know, it's been what a five, 10 year process of him battling this dude. And, and so, he didn't yeah. even, and the fandom didn't even get to uh, end his career in a sense. It was his, it was his daughter that did it, <laughs> which, and, and that's not a dig at the fandom. It's more of a, yeah. you know, like it's, uh, you know, it was literally the next generation that finished the battle of of their, you know of of his yeah well that was the idea to have uh to have heloise kind of show her uh, her phantom chops in mm. this and right. you know it's you could trace it all back to the phantom not uh not following goran's advice mm. you know, at the very beginning goran said you should tell Hel you should tell diana what's going on you yeah. should tell her who katia sahara is and he said, no, no, I've got this. You know, I don't believe we're proud of it. <laughs> that was actually one of my most favorite parts of the whole story was the interaction with the uh, Kit mm. Walker as the Phantom and Diana on the airplane when he had to tell her. And, you know, Diana flies off the handle and then you see the Phantom just kind of like lean back in his chair, put his hat on his face and go back to sleep. Like it was just kind of like, but it was a great moment of, like, I don't think we've ever seen the two of them fight as much. So um, it <laughs> well, was, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, he's, he does. He leans back in his seat and uh, Mike, Mike really captured that beautifully that he's, his attitude is I've got this. Yeah. And uh, that line occurs later on when Heloise is leaving the voicemail uh, for her dad you know, uh, hey, I'm with this mass murderer, and uh, I'm going to find out where yeah. he's going. And, uh, you know, don't worry, I've got this. He's looking at yeah. me funny, but uh, I've got this. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> and, and I must say, I, I particularly liked the line, um, and I know Jermaine, and, you know, obviously Heloise did actually land the, the killer punch, I suppose, but the, the, the line in the narration about... Um, uh, the nomad lies at the feet of 21 phantoms. Mm. It wasn't just yeah. movies, it was an entire, you know, generational uh, effort to, to bring him down. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there was a little bit of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's not literally true, but I, I, I guess the readers understood that it was a little bit of poetry, or it, it's mm. figuratively true. Mm. So, it was, uh, so it's, oh, sorry. Did you... I was very conscious of the fact that so she's a 15 year old, you know, basically fighting a guy that's like James Bond. And then she ended up on the adrenaline and the history of the family and, you know, competing with her brother. She's still a 15 year old girl. And one of the things about uh, someone when they're 15 is their brain is not fully developed yet. Have, <laughs> Adult impulses, but you also have childlike impulses. Yeah. So I was very aware of the fact that, and I teach a lot of 15 year olds, a lot of teenage uh, kids. I teach it in my, uh, my uh, 
illustration, and you realize that you get that mix of someone who can be very, very confident on one hand, one moment, and then very uh, fearful in the next moment or illogical in the next moment. And if you just made her uh, suddenly a hero, then it becomes like a cliche and you don't see that, you don't see the character struggle. And she's not, you know, Supergirl, so she's not invulnerable if we cancel the laws of gravity or whatever. So I was very aware of the fact that uh, you know, she's even if you're a, a buff, fit, fifteen year old karate gymnast, if you're fighting James Bond, you can still get your head taken off. Mm. Yeah. Was that um, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, you go. Oh no, was, was that part of the reason why uh, in the fight um, then in the, on the plane, uh, Heloise used weapons, uh, you know, whatever came to hand. She picked up a shoe and smacked him across the face with that. She whacked a, you know, you know, whacked him with her, her phone across the nose, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. is, is that, That's exactly uh, what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. The weapon of a 15-year-old girl. A mobile phone. High heels. <laughs> <laughs> no, the phone there, Jim. Wait until, wait until your kids are older, mate. Hey, it's all right for you. You've got boys. Yeah, when Mike's saying about all this about all this stuff, I'm just like, Mike, you're scaring me. I've got two girls. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dan and I teach the 15-year-old girls, so, yeah, we know what Mike's talking about. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, she's, uh, I mean, she, she, as Mike says, Heloise is very fit and she's had training since uh, childhood. But, I mean, she's also, she's got to be an opportunistic opponent mm. as well. So she uses the tools at hand and uh, got the job done. Yeah. Now, I got to, we in a previous podcast, we were talking about how in some of, Lee Fork's scripts, it almost seems like he made it up as he kind of went. Now, before you said, Tony, that you had this story, the concept or the synopsis kind of written three yeah. years ago, the like, so there's, there's some huge plot twists in the whole story, like with the double at the camp, uh, which kind of threw me totally. Um, you know, and then the battle, and then there was, um, you know, then there was the, the way that it was all captured, the nomad was captured and all that. Were there any parts in the story where you kind of made it up on the fly, or was this all laid out and all went according to plan, so to speak? Yeah, no, there's usually minor changes that happen, um, but no, all the all the bones of it are in the synopsis. Yeah, well, wow. it was yeah. it was very much a, a story of two halves uh, in that in that sense as as what Jermaine's saying there wasn't it? I I if you'd told me three weeks in that this was going to end with being a, a major story about Heloise, I, I would have said, hang on, she's not even in the story. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, that's uh, you know that that whole thing with the Jungle Patrol uh, at the beginning that was a bit of misdirection mm. to <laughs> achieve achieve exactly the purpose she just. Uh, talked about because yeah. the jungle patrol doesn't come back yes you know? no, no they just yeah. scope the that place was, out and then the phantom's that, in yeah yeah that was a little bit of misdirection uh to um well you know you want to surprise readers so yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. the idea so was there was there any thought of maybe killing off the 21st phantom during the battle at the camp or anything like that or was he always going to get out of that Oh yeah, no, no, he wasn't wasn't gonna die there. Uh, you know, I I just I'm not sure I see King Features ever being confident enough in the franchise, if yeah. for lack of a better word, to uh, to kill off the Phantom. But that said, if they want him to die, I'd be delighted to write that because. <laughs> I... <laughs> I don't think I'd be delighted to read it, though. I, 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 a very, very sad day. It would be. It, it would be. Uh, but, uh, so, so, Mike, talking of um, you know killing off the Phantom potentially, the <laughs> that firefight in the um, in the, the Nomads camp was uh, horrific, and it's the, the, the closest mm. I think we've ever seen. Uh, when you get a script to come through and says. Um, 
you know, there, there's the hut surrounded by guns and uh, everybody's shooting it and um, rocket launchers are coming through the windows and the Phantom survives by hiding behind a mattress. Do you, do you go, wow, how am I going to, how am I going to draw this? Um, luckily, no. <laughs> luckily, luckily, I think when, you know, Tony writes such a, a good, clear, a very visually uh, stimulating script, so uh, the difficulty really in staging is that you only have three panels. You only have that yeah. limited piece. I'm thinking, you know, coming from comic books initially, not coming from comic strips, I think, oh, man, if I could have a splash page or I could have a double page <laughs> spread. But um, so it's, it's trying to, to make that little box as exciting as possible. Um, that, that, so that's really the difficulty. Sometimes I wish I had a Sunday page or uh, yeah. I, I more visual real estate to play with. It's, 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 I feel more constricted at times just visually because, like I said, my instincts were trained from the comic page and I had to learn, you know, how to do it uh, on the comic strip. I mean, that's that's always the biggest, maybe the biggest hurdle, is just the amount of space that you have. Well, so, I think you've done a fantastic job there, Mike. Just looking, well, talking about that mattress part, you pretty much used the the full rectangle, if you will, with a little insert there with the with the rocket going in, and then it, it rebounds off the um off the mattress. And I, I've noticed you do that. Uh, I mean, a number of panels throughout throughout the story. It's probably the the, um, the comic strip equi equivalent of a splash page using the whole whole rectangle, um, which and I think you do that to great effect. And I really love the um, the the next day after he's you know deflected the the rocket coming out of the um, it, and you know gets out of the um, makes a great big hole in the wall, and then yeah he comes out with a very triumphant pose and you know ready to go devil, <laughs> you know it's just. Awesome. Then you read the next page. Oh, get, get back in. Get back in. There's more people coming. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Well, it's uh, it's kind of what's fun about the character. I think is that, you know, he's not uh, he's not all knowing. He's not all powerful. Mm. He tries this. It doesn't work. He backs up and tries something else. And, mm. uh, and we all we all do that. Yeah. And certainly yeah. To, to tie those. Oh, sorry, Mike. Oh, I was just saying. There's all. I mean going back and reading through as I, as I get a chance the stories, there's a, there's always um, a sense of humor to the strip that comic books today don't have. Everything's very serious and very grim. Yeah. And he's more like what Batman used to be like, or I guess you would say like the Dark Knight. Or oh, yeah, Batman. Frank Miller humor, you know, um, and, and I think that also makes him more of a, of a full personality as opposed to just always just being a guy with a pinched face all the time. Yeah. One. And, and I think the, um, not just a sense of humor, but a sense of humanity and, and to tie those ideas together, mm. one of my uh, standout panels, and I know, Jermaine, you've also mentioned this to me, the, the strip that appears on the 3rd of November, which is the big one panel just after the Phantom's got the news, he goes, how am I going to tell this to Diana? Step one, go and sit on the, th the Skull Throne. And that, and that splash page, if you like, um, of the Phantom just looking mm. worried and concerned and he knows that whatever has happened has happened and there's nothing he can do about it, that hopelessness. Well, I don't think we see that in yeah. the Phantom a lot and I think he captured it brilliantly in that, uh, in that one image. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I actually, I like that, too. I like, one of the things I liked about the story is that, uh, you know, and then reading fans' reactions, because some people are thinking, like, oh, he's going to get in his airplane, he's going to cross the Atlantic, he's going to be, you know, uh, 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 in New York. And I think it's, it's, um, it's more realistic in an adventure strip I, I think it makes the, the readers really feel that, you know, Heloise could have, you know, could have been seriously hurt. Yeah. And, it, 
And uh, I also think that for a father who is the, you know, the father, uh, a young adventure character, if he doesn't feel any danger, then that it does, then it becomes unrealistic. Then it becomes mm -hmm. just like everything happens just because we want it to happen. You know, you, you, you know, you, you ratchet up the tension, but there's no, there's no danger. That's why I had, I love that one panel strip of her saying, you know, basically, daddy, I want to come home. You know, mm, yeah. becoming a teenager as, as opposed to, Standing there on the corner with a flashlight below, casting up some dramatic angle, you know, being all very heroic and unrealistic. I think that um, uh, it, it makes her a, a much more of a real hmm. character. I think yeah, she's just definitely. been through an incredibly stressful situation, and you can almost see the moment where I'm on the phone to dad and I've, you know, I'm away and uh, safe again. Um, but you can always see the moment where the the, the adrenaline, the adrenaline is cuts gone out, and uh, suddenly she's she's human and real again. Mm. Well, if you are in a car accident, or you're playing sports or anything, you get that whole thing where you get really excited, or you're going to have a you know some important meeting or something, and you have that that build up, and then that moment of actually just being totally drained. Yeah. Afterwards, you know. Um, and uh, to me, those are the those are the uh, I get to do. It's the thing is, it's easy to draw action. It's harder to draw stuff like that. It's harder to make mm. the characters acting. Sometimes it would be great, you know, to be able to have more time to use models and things like that, like the guys used to do in the old days. Metaphor. Drake or Raymond, you know, they would, they would, but, uh, uh, so, you know, sometimes uh, I'll have uh, Mimi's here, I'll have her like hold her, like put your arm up like this or, you know, something, but uh, usually I don't get a chance to do that. Yeah. Mm. Can, I can pretty much, well, for me, um, the point where the adrenaline kind of wears off is when she takes the sunnies off, like, after the fight, she's you know so full of it, and she puts the sunnies on. To me, she goes from being um, Heloise Walker to Ms. Miss Walker or Ms. Walker. You know, like you know, she walks the streets like an ordinary teenage girl. So she's got the dark sunnies on, <laughs> and hides the eyes like a phantom. But then she's not quite ready, and the and the and the sunnies come off. And um, yeah, I just I, I like that um, mm. that whole part of the story there. Mm. Well, you know, there's uh, when Mike was talking about the uh, the space issue, that recalled for me the. Uh, let me see. I think this is this is the strip that's going to run on November seventh. Uh, where... Oh, that's my other. Thing. I like that one as well. Yeah. <clears throat> God, it's just so well done. Uh, where yeah. it's uh, it's one panel, but two images of Heloise. Mm walking and talking to her yeah. her dad and uh, uh, basically she's telling him you know I I understand where I come from now you know this is yeah. this is what I was born to and uh, when I saw that I was just blown away by that mm. how Mike handled that it would have been so much less effective broken up into uh, two panels mm. yeah uh, Thoroughly agree. Um, just while we were talking about that panel, um, just one little uh, question, I suppose. You've said there, um, uh, well, she says that one of the, the women in her her, her lineage is Juliet Walker. Um, is that does that mean Julie Walker? I know we're we've, we're looking at a um, an unedited or not not a final copy. Is that supposed to be Julie Walker? Have I got that wrong? No, Julie Julie Walker was a uh, sister of one of the Phantoms. Yes. Uh, Juliet Walker. Was, uh, she was Captain the, Amazon, yeah. Captain Amazon, the Pirate Queen. Oh, right. Juliet Adams, who was a Captain Amazon Pirate Queen, and which is a Mary. story done by Lee Fork and Cy Barry, um, and married the 15th Phantom in 1831. And Juliet Walker was also in the story Death Stalks the Fifth Phantom, which was done by Tony D. Paul and... Right. 
um, uh, Terry Beatty. Jim right. knew that was going to come up, didn't you, <laughs> didn't you, yeah, mate? I, I have a feeling. <laughs> yeah. Came prepared, didn't he? I should know better than to ask. Uh, it's just the the way that it's uh, that that um, mm. piece of dialogue is with the the, the comma. I wasn't sure if, if uh, Juliet Walker was the pirate queen or where, or she was listing um, people, uh, other you know, a range of people. But oh, she was a she was a tough Tony woman. <laughs> she was a uh, she was a tough woman that one, Julia uh, Julia Adams slash Walker. Um, I think from memory, uh, her dad died, and and she like captain a uh, a pirate ship and and stuff like that. So um, yeah, she, right. she was a tough woman. Well, and uh, and you can see that in in Heloise. Mm. But as as Mike says, uh, she is fifteen, you know, and and. Mm. Uh, you have to be really aware of that. Hmm. But in saying that, I, like I, I re, I, this week I read the whole story from the beginning to the end. It was almost hmm. like she aged hmm. mentally, but also physically during the story, if you know what I mean. She developed as a character. Yeah, and like I'd always, it was. She, yeah, she developed as a character, but she also developed mentally and physically in the way she was behaved, but also the way, in my opinion, the way she was drawn. And she's a really likable character now. Was that a deliberate effort on your part, Mike, to uh, to get that idea in Jermaine's head? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the tough thing about drawing a 15-year-old because a 15 year old can look 25 years old, and a 15 year old, some of them, some of them look younger. And a lot of it has to do with the way they put their hair or they carry themselves. Because you're right in that in between stage. It's, you know, if, if you see a 15 year old today, it's not the way a 15 year old looked in 1950. Hmm. Right? And so I don't want to make her too sexy. Because then she yeah. becomes a cliche, but then I yeah. don't make her. Uh, I don't. Hello. Hello, Mark. Uh, I think you cut out, buddy. You there, Tony, as well? Yeah, I'm here, but uh, Mike's uh, screen is frozen, so I think we lost him. Uh, hmm. I'll uh, stand by if you wanna wanna try to reach him again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, he's gone oh. all together now. I think. Oh, that's all right. So, Tony, did was that part of your? Well, it's not all right, but. <laughs> no, no, it's not all right. No, no, we <laughs> should absolutely get Mike back. Yeah, no, that's what I didn't mean it like that. Uh, you, you know, part of uh, the, 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 the issues that Mike was um, talking about with how to depict. Heloise mm. and and to get it right uh you know that's why I, I i so completely trust him with the script mm. is that i i, I know that he's going to uh he's going to go through those issues and come up with the uh, uh with the right answer uh especially and on the action sequences uh you know i i do so much I less is Mike back? I think so. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. You've gone probably okay. a little bit quiet again. Okay. Hold on a second. But at least you're back. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's yeah. go back and finish. Uh, we can finish Mike's stuff. I was just going to um, say on the action that I, I uh, you know, it, with previous um, artists, I've, I've uh, done a lot more of um, the script has sort of done a lot more of the choreographing of the action uh, with, with Mike, you just let him go. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, just, you know, the phantom slugs a guy. It's all you have to say. And then you'll see something really interesting, like the guy flying through a wall or something like that. Um, so so I, did you I, write the parts about Heloise using the phone and the, and the, um, shoe and that sort of stuff, or was that all Mike? Uh, that that was in the script. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, the using the weapons of opportunity. Um, now in the 
in the tail coming up after after the next one. Uh, there's going to be a lot of action in that where uh, that will that will be choreographed by Mike. So, um, yeah. So I completely trust him to to uh, to uh, make the make the best uh, use of the script. You know, I don't. I never worry about it that it's uh, that he's going to get anything like that wrong. So, mm-hmm. it's a, a great great Mike. partner to work. I remember you posting. It must have, obviously it was around the time that you were drawing the the action in the lead in the jet. Um, posting a a comment on Facebook about how um, how do you draw a, a fight in the confined spaces of a jet? Um, you know the difficulties around that. Um, were you happy with how it uh, how it came out? We certainly were. I'm I'm sure you guys cut out a little bit. So can you repeat that? Uh, just um, your your comment on Facebook about uh, how difficult it was to draw a fight or an action scene inside uh, the confined spaces of a of a jet. Um, were you happy with the with the end result? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you always have to take a little bit of liberty with stuff in order to make it work for a comic strip. In fact, I was commenting to. One of the lines uh, was it yesterday or the day before, uh, because you know I use uh, Learjet. A certain type of, it's actually very difficult to look at the specific door handle in a Learjet 60. Different miles of a Learjet. I can see one where the door opens this way, one where the door opens that way. Um, uh, so. You know, I mean, it is a superhero strip. You want it to be believable and realistic, but I mean, at a certain point, it's like if you can't find that exact angle for reference you have available, it's not like you can go out to the airport and just let <laughs> you get on their uh, their jet and take a and take a picture. But yeah, you know, I had to do or had somebody I think once had to do Lois Lane fighting guys in the back of a car. Or a limo, or something, you know, and that's the kind of stuff where in film you get the cutting, hmm. you know. Hmm. So uh, uh, that compensates for the space. In a comic, you don't have the cutting. Um, then you have the word balloons, so you have to deal with a lot, a lot more, uh, a lot more elements. Yeah, sure. Well, I think you've I think you've nailed it, particularly um, right at the right at the start of the fight in the in the cockpit where um, Heloise just gives him a roundhouse kick in the head. Yeah, and I remember reading that. And, wow, check that out! And I and I remember hearing you know your words going through through my head. You know about um, how do you create a fight scene in a jet? Well, kick him in the head—that's a great way to start. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I also love um, her one-liner. Um, you know, I can't allow you to take off. You can't allow me. You know, blah 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 blah. Well, God, I don't know how to land a jet. That's why I can't allow you to take <laughs> off. I did have a good chuckle at that, Tony. <laughs> We're good. Uh, yeah, and she, uh, you know, this guy is going to do away with her at his refueling stop and sink her 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 body off a uh, an undersea cliff face. Uh, you know, never to be uh, discovered. Uh, now she doesn't. She doesn't know that. You know, the reader has, the reader, under, uh, has um, you know seen the inner dialogue of the fan, of the uh, the nomad. So the reader understands that. But I think Heloise just understands that. Uh, you know, it's the end of me if I go anywhere with this yeah. person. Yeah. So, yeah. Was so she was does, there any? Um, you make a great point about there was that powerful panel of Heloise actually, in a sense, seeing Heloise's death. Was there any censorship or any like worry about it being too graphic or people, uh, the editors or anything like that, uh, getting their hands on it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't worry. Not the she gets cracked in the head with you know with a. Vicious punch, so yeah. Yeah, Mike, you can uh, you can explain that. Okay, you guys cut out a little bit there. Uh, I think 
Um, well, there was some concern on the part of King, I think, of violence. And, of course, the time we live in, uh, I think people are much more sensitive to that issue. Um, personally, I, I think it would have, I mean, it would have been rough. I mean, that's the thing about the comics page. The comics, the comics page has this bright, funny wrapping uh, on a Sunday that covers, you know, murder and mayhem and the most heinous mm. things in the world on the inside. So on one hand, the syndicate uh, doesn't want to offend anybody. They want them to read the comics and then be offended. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you have your, your fun before uh, being offended. I, when I had him punch her, I had it the second after he punched her, so you don't actually see his fist touching her head. Yeah. Right? Now, usually, if you notice when I draw the phantom punching somebody, you see the contact very often, the contact of the fist against the the, the person's face or head. Um, I would have been okay if we had done a couple more shots of, like, you know, the Hitchcockian shadow where you could have seen the hit monster again. And then you have to weigh, well, is that too much? Does it become gratuitous? Um, you know, I think people today are much more desensitized to violence. I think if you hit, but the old comic strips were actually pretty violent. If you read mm. things like that, they actually show people get stabbed in the chest with a knife, stuff like that, that there's no way King would, uh, go day. Just even on Judge Parker, there was, uh, several times in the last couple of years where, uh, they made me change things um, with some gunplay because they seem to be more sensitive to that now when I had previously in Beach Parker actually shown characters, you know, point blank pointing shotguns in people's faces. So I think, you know, the point was if he socked her once and you could see it, and I tried to do it so that you could see that he hit her without actually showing his fist making contact. Uh, we got the point across. You know, then if he's like, sure. and all that, then that becomes like, what, R or PG-13 or, 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 and I think that we didn't need to do that. I think what Tony wrote was perfect. And if you saw it once, maybe that's all she needed to know that this guy was going to like, you know, basically, kill. And I really yeah. liked the line um, as she's dragging him off the off the plane wreck about um, uh, you fought me as if I was a grown man. How, how is that fair, sort of thing? Um, but the, along the line of that censorship and that sort of thing, um, Mike. Um, again, after that, uh, the firefight in the uh, the nomad's hut, um, the Phantom gets pretty badly shot up at, and all the rest of it and, and I think you, you know you depict that with um, his torn suit and which is not something that we see a, a whole lot or have seen a whole lot of uh, the, the phantom suit getting ripped up and and um, you know he's, he's about as exposed as we've seen but we don't see a whole lot of blood like there's probably only four or five um, panels or, or, or frames where there where there's blood and that's you know to do with the, the wound in the neck is that is that a censorship issue as well? No, I mean, I don't. I don't remember now. Pony mentioned that his suit got torn up, but I, I guess, I think that the uh, one of the things that always impressed me as a kid, reading uh, the Batman stuff that Neil Adams did, was that the Bat Batman suit would get torn up. And before that, I don't really remember his suit. He, Maybe, you know, back in the day, occasionally, you know, his cape would get torn or something like that. But those issues uh, with Raza's ghoul, uh, where, uh, you know, you would see him really get torn, I think it makes him more, more, you realize that he's mm. actually like a really fit human. Mm. Um, and it looks cool. It looks cool if the character's uniform gets torn up after a bomb blast or, or whatever. I mean, yep. you figure this guy, the Phantom, 
it's probably going to have that uh, same thing that those football players get from being blown up and hit and kicked. And so he may not uh, have to retire uh, because he gets killed. He may have to retire just because he's just gotten too beat up. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that the um, the torn suit really had a uh, be like, element of authentic, be like, authenticity to it. Yeah, yeah, he could he could still be around to uh, annoy the kid. Because... <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think that was in the script. I think that is all Mike's creation. Uh, I'd have to go back and check, but I, uh, I I like that too. I mean, the the fan of can't you know, go through a hailstorm of shrapnel and bullets uh, and not have his uh, his costume unscathed. So mm -hmm. I like that. And I've worked with some uh, artists, overseas artists, who, uh, <laughs> you know, I've had, like, guys uh, fall off a cliff and their hat doesn't come off, you know? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so now I appreciate the realism that Mike brought to that. Mm. And I Tony and I were talking, and you mentioned shot from Butch Cassidy at the end, where they where they're mm. running, scene of him running out with uh, Devil was based off that scene at the end of Butch Cassidy. Uh, so I actually found the still and sort of tried to to take uh, take uh, uh, inspiration from that. So uh, I mean, I think we're all. We've always been on the same uh, same page with that kind of stuff. And that's the you know that's the, the fun part when you work with somebody uh, like Tony, and, you know, respects the material, and but he also respects me, and I respect him. So you know, I'm always excited to get the script, um, and uh, it's the script is tight. The scripts are tight, and that's something I also appreciate because. Uh, you know, we have to that small little piece of real estate every day to deal with. Huh. And, mm. uh, I never feel like I have in the past with some with some art writers. I never feel like anything is ever overwritten. You must do the Roy Crane thing of rewriting it three times or something. Uh, is that yeah. is that what you uh, do, Tony? <laughs> uh, well. I mean, it, it definitely gets a lot of attention, but it's not like, um, you know, uh, three or four years ago, the the scripts were finished and in the can for a year before they uh, they went to the artist. Oh, so wow. that, that there's certainly a lot of opportunity to, you know, six months later think, you know what, I, I want to change that ending a little bit. Oh. Uh, and now, you know, I'm kind of more... Uh, just kind of writing as we go, even though there is a there's a fully developed synopsis, um, the the script is sort of always in process. You know, I think Mike's got three weeks of script, uh, the next three weeks, and I th I think Jeff has like one more week. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, next week I'll be writing for them again. Mm. So. Tony, has there been uh, any changes that Mike has done to your scripts? Uh, I, I'm, I don't know what you mean. Changes? Of... Oh, like, um, like, has he, does he have freedom to change your script or is it uh like has he or you know just playing devil's advocate here you know has yeah no i mean the artist uh, i think i probably said said this before but uh you know the artist doesn't work for the writer i mean the artist is uh not a potted plant <laughs> you know uh, so yeah. uh no i mean it's his job to interpret the script and uh that's perfectly all right it, it's it's a partnership so mm. Now, I, I, I do have one question I need to ask because um, we, you know, I, I think you're doing a brilliant job and, and I'll come to this later about um, handling the fandom's legacy and uh, the, the, the law of um, the fandom, etc. There was a very deliberate decision that, uh, that you made around, um, it, it, it's almost written in stone for the fandom for probably the last 60 years of his 80 years. Um, that the Phantom does not kill. The Phantom <laughs> does not 
deliberately kill uh, a bad guy. It's always knock him out and take him to the police, basically, or leave him for the jungle patrol. Um, there is a deliberate decision, and I think we all understand if you, you're surrounded by uh, lots of people with flamethrowers and rocket launchers and guns, you're going to have to do something to get out there, to get out of there. The, the Phantom does kill somebody quite deliberately and makes that decision, and we see the decision being made to, uh, to take out the flamethrower and use that as the diversion to escape. What's the, the thought process around, for yourself as an author, making that decision? Well, you know, I, I just thought in recent years that to add a little bit of realism, uh, in the most extreme circumstances, uh, he, he has to use the uh, weapons in the way that they're designed to be used. I mean, otherwise, he's dressing up in a costume and he's faintly ridiculous, you know? I mean, why carry the weapons if, uh, if they're uh, not to be used hmm. in extremists? So, I mean, I would never have him use his guns gratuitously. Hmm. I mean, he's not the kind of personality who... You know what? He would be exactly the same person if he didn't carry the guns. I'm convinced of that. Mm. Uh, you know, he doesn't derive his courage from his from carrying the the 45s. Uh, but you know, in a in a desperate situation where he cannot possibly survive any other way, mm. and he's completely outnumbered, then I I uh, I think it's okay for him to uh, yep. to use the weapons. So I mean, I, we'll we'll never we'll never show him. Uh, I don't think. We'll never show him actually, you know, uh, blasting away at some guy who is not a real threat. He's not. Uh, yeah. There, <laughs> yeah. That's what I was thinking. I mean, not the punish. Not the Marvel guy. I would. I would. I would hate to see him become that. Mm. Uh, mm. But you know, there was a there was a Sunday story uh, that Terry Beatty did where, you know, we did have, oh gosh, was it the fourth? I can't remember which Phantom. It might have been the Fourteenth Phantom where we showed him uh, killing a guy who was about to execute him. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. It, to my memory, Lee Falk never showed that, but I think just to add a little bit of realism, it's um, something we need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not like he yeah. never did because, um, you know, uh, was it the Diamond Hunters, Jermaine? You'll know this better than I do, but Smiley um, was, yeah. was the bad guy who the Phantom shot out of a tree. And that, again, was um, quite, a, quite a deliberate... Uh, and that, what was that, Germ, the 40s? Uh, no, I think it was even the late 30s. That was more of a, like a, a life and death situation yeah. where Smiley was in a tree, had a gun, at lining, him, lining him up, and yeah. lined him up, and then the Phantom. I think Devil barked, and you know, by the yes. time he barked, he draw the gun, shot him before he could get shot. So, it's not. Yeah, it was a very. Um, it, it, yeah, probably, it's, not, it's not like it's never probably happened, the most but... the most deliberate act would probably be in the uh, Phantom Goes to War storyline, mm -hmm. where um, that's but that's again that's war again, but that's probably the most. Uh, you know, one of the most um, uh, deliberate acts of, of death was uh, like when he was going under the water with the colonel or the general, mm -hmm. I think it was, or uh, Lieutenant Crouchy, I think it was, mm -hmm. and he um, took him underneath the water and he didn't return. Well, you know, that, that story is... Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, it, it's, a, it's an example of... Uh, uh, even Falk could could kind of go off the rails, uh, I guess, <laughs> because of the, you yeah. know, the emotion that caught up in the, uh, the emotion after, uh, you know, the attack on Pearl Harbor and all that. Mm -hmm. And my, I, I haven't read that story in many years, but my recollection is that <laughs> in the beginning, Falk is, he, he's trying to uh, not have the Phantom use his guns on the Japanese. Uh, so he's killing them with his hands. I mean, doesn't he yeah. like <laughs> choke a guy? And yeah. Uh, yeah, he's killing them with his hands, which is even sort of more violent, more uh, grotesque. And then finally, just he's yeah. And then finally, he just starts shooting them. So I imagine, I think the the the, the little caption or text line was, 
you know, the Phantom pots the Japanese or something. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, we just, uh, just start shooting them. So I think Falk mm. probably decided, you know what? It's actually less violent. <laughs> mm. He uses his guns. So. Well, uh, there is a theory that uh, it wasn't actually Lee Falk that wrote that story and a couple of the other ones. Uh, but Alfred Bester, who was a um, ghostwriter for Lee Falk while he was actually in the army or doing in the intelligence area. So, Yeah, uh, I've heard that. His, his, his name is on it, so it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it belongs, he, he owns it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like in newspapers, uh, you'll have editorial... Uh, Editors can build in errors in your story, but it's your byline, so, you know. <laughs> I'm assuming that's happened a few times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, Steve, did you want to jump in, mate? I've, I've pinched a couple oh. of your questions, I think, so far. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just that we had the same thought at the same time. I'm just scrolling through the through the story um, at the moment, and I'm just looking at the, the part where the, the Phantom comes back into the cave, and and he's there getting the blood, uh, is the correct term, blood transfusion from Babudan there? Yeah. Is, it, is that the first time he, he's had um, Bandar blood running through his veins? He truly becomes a, a Bandar, or...? I'm, for some reason, I got a memory of that happening before, but maybe that was in an Egmont. Uh, it was an Egmont story with uh, Lamanda Luaga. Uh, it was called the Blood Brothers. Okay. Well, uh, uh, yeah. Well, Luaga is not a Bandar, but uh, mm. I, I wasn't aware of that. But you yeah, know, I, I thought this was a first with the uh, the mm. Bandar. I think it's. I think it's the first with the Bandar. Um, where, yeah, the only other time we've seen a transfusion was, yeah, with the Waga. Well, that didn't well, happen in the newspapers, like, though, did it? So it's, it's, um, it's a good <laughs> suggestion, but not necessarily real. Yeah. The, um, you know, the Walker family has such a close relationship with the Bandar. Yeah. In, the, um, in the story where uh, Babudan's son uh, challenges Goran for the leadership of the tribe, I think it's Kit who, uh, the Phantom keeps telling his kids that, you know, we're not Bandar, don't interfere in this decision. Mm. And uh, I think one of them says, we might as well be Bandar, you know, yeah. uh, all our friends are Bandar and we live here. And uh, yeah, so I thought the transfusion thing was kind of uh, one more, one more sign of just how closely connected yeah. they are. Mm. Totally and I, agree. I, I really enjoyed the the whole scene of um, the Phantom coming back and needing the medical help from Goran and the banter between the two of them about, um, <laughs> uh, you know. I'm I, not I, really an immortal ghost. <laughs> no, yeah, that's right. I, I've got a secret to tell you. Um, no, I, I, th I thought I appreciate that you held that in. I thought you'd like that. I did that and that sort of thing. So that, that was all um, really quite entertaining and, and uh, one of the, the, yeah, like a whole run of one-liners that was, um, you know, get, got that phantom wit um, that that we like so much. Oh, um, good. Glad you enjoyed that. Now, one of the one of the, the questions I'm really interested to ask, and and this is, I guess, for both of you guys, because um, I think um, Mike, you you are you you you're not afraid of making a political comment on your on your social media and, <laughs> and um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know where your allegiances lie in the in the grand scheme of things of what's happening in the world at the moment um, and and the the strip that appeared on July the 4th um, which is obviously Independence Day in America was the nomad at um, the uh, Statue of Liberty Statue of Liberty and uh, there seemed to be uh, a, a not so subtle dig at the leadership and the and the politics that's going on in America at the moment. So a couple of questions, like how deliberate was that, and, and um, you know, is that a is that a is that a, a, a deliberate dig at um, what's going on in the world at the moment? That's part one. And part two, how hard is that to line it up so it's exactly on July the fourth? Well, I'll let I'll let uh, uh, Tony take take that. I mean, I because he he wrote it, so he was he was thinking about <laughs> the, 
me up in the Statue of Liberty and everything. So, <laughs> well, the uh, the timing is a complete accident. Oh really? <laughs> it, really? Uh, it happened to be the Fourth of July, uh, but uh, but no, the uh, the sentiment that was uh, certainly intentional. Uh, because you know we're going through a, a dark time with a lot of xenophobia here, and mm. it's kind of disgraceful for a, a country that is built on uh, on people coming here to, to uh, reinvent Which, themselves yes. and make new lives for themselves. So um, I thought it was an interesting twist uh, that to have this terrorist uh, having this particular take mm. on this. Uh, you know this uh, revered national monument that he's touring, and and just so, complete coincidence that it was on the fourth of July. <laughs> yes, uh, just uh, wow. right. It was in the you, script, and there it is on the fourth. <laughs> so, because uh, on fa on uh, Comic Kingdom, which I'm sure everyone here is a fan of, um, there was a lot of comments about that uh, that that strip on that day. I can imagine. <laughs> see, see, the thing is, I, I didn't make that connection straight away. Um, like I see the Statue of Liberty there, there, and the way that the you know the, you know the, the characters are up there in, in the is I guess you call the it a crown. crown. Yeah. Um, my brain went to Ghostbusters too. <laughs> what? <laughs> Ghostbusters too, when they're up at the Statue of Liberty and they're talking and they're thinking about what they're going to do next. <laughs> so I'm just too much of a good guy to think about what the bad guy is doing. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it again. I'm still thinking, yep, and, they, and she's about to take off and smash the library or the museum off. <laughs> um, anyway. Mike, um, oh, sorry, Tony, you, go. You never even, and you, you don't even intend. I mean, that the interesting. I've been on this a couple of years now, and this current storyline, especially like the last two months, Probably had more uh, comment than you know anything else I've, I've I've been a part of you know at least on the message board. And it's always amazing to me the things that people read into mm. stuff and then stuff they completely miss that is very obvious. And it seems like there's a couple different camps. There's the camp who hates everything, which is <laughs> but they keep writing it. They're just the angry people that just like to be angry and and be angry every day. There's the older fans who occasionally chime in, and then there's the I don't know the 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 the, the people that don't know how to read a comic strip. They <laughs> think oh, I've read seven strips in a row of Grand talking to the Phantom. They've been standing there for seven days. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, uh, like the whole thing about Heloise and the phone, right? Um, mm. Commented on the other day um, because people are like, well, how does she have her phone? It's like, well, she put her phone in her bra or sports bra and she took the money or her ID and she put that in her other part of her bra or in her panties or whatever. I mean, that's just like a logical thing. I've actually had, you know, friends who, female friends who, who, have, who have done that. And I actually yeah. showed her carrying the phone in her, in her, you know, and you can see it peeking out of the dress. So it's there, but it's like they just want to assume that you are trying to like pull a fast one over yeah, on them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's so it's very, it's very, it's very odd to see what, how. Uh, people, uh, there was one guy who was uh, mad because, you know, Heloise is going to obviously, obviously, Tony is trying to ruin the thing. That's very, <laughs> he's going to make a girl into the Phantom, you know, that's been the plan all along. You know, it's weird when people read into stuff that's just like, they should become, they should, they should write their own little fan fiction of the, of the Phantom. Mm -hmm. So, how how hard is it not to comment, or do you just well, go no, for well, it? No. And 
Germ, you you may not have picked it up, but about a month or six weeks ago, yeah, maybe, yeah, no, Mike? that's what I was gonna say. Is yeah. like, how hard is it to like not comment and then you comment and is it something that you have to watch yourself, Mike, or do you just like just go for it whenever you feel like it? Uh, I I watch what I say or who I say it to from the standpoint that. Obviously, you know, a fan of your work can read anything that you do and go, well, I like that, but I didn't like that. And that's yeah. normal, right? Because we all like episodes of Star Trek or whatever, we, and others we don't, right? We like this mm. episode, this book, or this issue better than other things. That's fine. Um, it's when there's a lot of people, like, totally missing, a, to me, what was a very obvious point, but occasionally I will say, I will pop in and say, oh, I was doing this, I was doing that, I was using this reference, I was doing that kind of a thing. Um, and that's usually to a couple of people on the board that who I've read their comments before, and they're, you know, like I said, you can disagree or not like something that you can be respectful, mm. but there's also that side, which to me is unfortunate, there's too many that are just disrespectful and they sort of like try to insult you every day. And you know, if you were meeting that person at a convention, they would never come up and talk to you hmm. in that yeah. respect fashion. So I, 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 I'm very particular, or, or like I did the other day about the, uh, the her wearing the, where she was keeping the phone and and things like that. Um, I will occasionally, or like. The uh, the guy was asking me about the Learjet or things like mm. that. I will I will I will uh, chime in. Uh, I no longer do that on the Judge Parker board. That the people have just gone too far off the deep end for me there. So I just <laughs> I, I do talk to some fans off the board. People who will write me privately, yeah. and we discuss things, which is cool. I like you know I like that. Yes. Um, don't want to get into this, you know, thing where like every day, you know, Tony and I get up and we have a conference call and we decide how can we ruin Lee Falk? <laughs> like, didn't quite ruin it enough yesterday. Um, well, you know, I, uh, I I don't read the comments board, uh, but I I do enjoy hearing from readers privately, and I want to say about a month ago I had a uh, I had a, a really detailed, lengthy email from a guy who's been reading The Phantom since before World War II when he was a kid. Oh, wow. And he was on the edge of his seat, and he's like, who saves Heloise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, he was loving the story, but that was his big question, who saves Heloise? I said, you know what, just... Let the story play out and then uh, write back to me and tell me what you think. I haven't heard yet. I think when I do hear, I think he will be furious that she saves herself. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hope not because that uh, I, I love this story for the development of the character of Heloise. I think mm. this is the first time. Uh, this is just about. This would have to be, I think, the most important story for Heloise in the history yeah. of the Phantom comic strip because this is the, the, the most development that she's just about ever had, I think, as a character. I, yeah. I remember one set when she was seven or eight and uh, she and Kit fight off some um, uh, panthers with stone-tipped arrows or something along those lines. But other than that, you know, I, I, one of my favourite... We've seen glimpses. Story, but... Yeah, it, it mm. is, she stands up and she's ready to... Well, in fact, she swears the oath. Um, via, yeah. via voice message as, as per <laughs> teenagers in 2018. Um, but, uh, you know, she, I, I hope that, uh, that your, your, um, your pen pal there appreciates the fact that uh, what's been going on for Heloise as a character here. Mm. He, might, he might surprise me. I hope so. Mm. But, uh, but, you know, it's funny, as Mike says, that they're concerned about so many readers miss that completely and just wonder, you know, where is she stashing her phone? Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, it reminds me of something that Paul, uh, Paul Ryan uh, used to do in the, and I may have mentioned this before, but in uh, uh, 
you know, he would always draw, uh, you wonder about the little sort of banal details of life in these strips. And uh, he would always draw, uh, if you go back and look at some of the, the images that he drew of uh, the python in his cell, you will see a glass on the sink with the python's toothbrush in it. Oh, really? Just in case, just in case the reader is wondering, does the python <laughs> brush his teeth every morning before he tries to figure out a way to ruin the phantom's oh, wow. life? Oh, so, uh, it's important to have good hygiene. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm sure the commenters know, <laughs> would really pick up on that. I'm in a privileged position where my um, paper still carries the phantom, so I don't have to. Um, be tempted to scroll down and have a look what people are saying, except on a Sunday, my um, the paper doesn't carry the, the Sunday fandom, so I have to go in Comics Kingdom to to, yeah. to read that one, but I often get on get in there as early as I can, so um, there's not many comments on there by the time I read it. Mm. Mm. And, and so, I that might have been I'm glad that Mike keeps track of it. Tony, I think it might have been you who said last time we spoke to you about the, mm. the commenters... It's a different genre. Really they're got, they're yeah. commenting for each other, and um, yeah, they're just you know, entertaining themselves. They're entertaining themselves and each other. And uh, since you've said that, I, I've read the comments in a completely different light, where it, it all washes off a little bit easier. I think so. Um, I thought that was very wise. I just think um, it's very odd that, that you know, if you want pen pals, get a pen pal. <laughs> <laughs> You, know, you so, can have a, yeah. a chat group for you know where you could just pretend you're like a you're a writers for a, 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 like old comedians like uh, Don Rickles or something. <laughs> yeah, like it's one thing to be critical, but there's nothing to be nasty. Like you know, we're, we're on the mm. podcast, we re we review stories, and we don't like every story, um, but we like to think that we're we're nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that, uh, well, I know that other uh, message boards have been shut down. Um, there does seem to be, there seems to be a point at which the line is crossed. Now, I know one of the issues King was dealing with recently was there were uh, some kind of spam bots spamming their message boards, posting links to porn websites. So, I mean, every day there's probably something going on. Occasionally I will flag a comment if I think that people are being a little bit too uh, personable uh, as far as their criticism. Um, but, uh, I mean, you want people to, if nobody writes, then I guess you're not doing anything. Uh. In um, but, uh, I also think that, you know, part of the problem you have with a script like this is that you have the, like I said, the different strata. So you have the guy that broke Tony that, or like my dad, dad's, uh, 85. So he read the Phantom as a kid. So if it's the same guy and then he had teenage kids, uh, you know, if you make them unrealistic, then they just become tropes that you pull out every once in a while so that you can have pretend like he has a family or something like that. I mean, I think it, it's difficult to write a script about this fictional guy who lives in the jungle and still has not been detected by satellite or anything else, but he still has to have a cell phone. Uh, that's one of the things I, I, I was thinking because I'm drawing that computer that weird computer mm. that I guess Paul came up with. And so it doesn't really look like a keyboard. I'm like keeping the continuity of the keyboard. But I was thinking like, well, maybe the, the, the Phantom should have a whole new system in the cave. Maybe there's like some, you know, a Bondar that went off and, you know, uh, learned all about the technology and he's coming back and he's wiring his village so they can get satellite and he can come in and say, mm -hmm. well, Ghost of Walks, I uh, need to uh, get the latest uh, Wi-Fi and this and that. Uh, he does have to have a computer. He does have to have uh, the ability to talk to his, it has to be encrypted, I suppose, somehow, right? 
Um, that was, oh, that was the other thing that the, that the fans were completely going crazy about was with your phone. And the idea that like somehow the police would take your phone and get hack your phone and get all the secrets. And it's like, once your phone turns off, you can't, no one else can access it. I mean, the FBI could only access those phones if Apple was willing to give them the code. So there's no way anyone could take Heloise's phone and realize that, you know, she was to a guy in a cave somewhere. Mm. You know. Yeah. Well, I I I hope that uh, whichever bandar comes back from civilization and brings that idea, also brings the idea of some sort of uh, uh, a shield or whatever to go over the deep woods, so that's a black spot and Google Maps can never actually identify where <laughs> the deep woods and uh, the skull cave is. Um, and, and that I think was one of the things about this story that really placed it in modern times. Um, you know, the the phones and the communication between. Heloise and um, her dad and all, and all the rest of it, that, that's a really crucial element. But even to the point of body cameras being on police officers, and that's a, a key plot point, um, even using the term fake news, which is very 2017, 2018, um, it, it very much places it as a, as a modern story. Yeah, uh, fake news uh, to denounce real news. Mm. Yeah, that's what makes it relevant. Mm. Yes. So. so just something random, um, Mike, I've had my daughters on the podcast a few times and I've noticed uh, you've got a very another special guest that's uh, been visiting you on and off during uh, <laughs> this podcast. Uh, what, what's the cat's name? Oh, that's my cat, Cornwell. So what, Cornwell? Yeah, the illustrator, uh, Dean Cornwell. Uh, okay, yeah. All right. Cool. So, so, so YouTube listeners, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, pod audio listeners, go and check out the YouTube version of this, and you can see Cornwell appear in uh, in Mike's video feed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm have to do the same thing. I haven't been having the the video feed up. I've been checking out the the strip and stuff. So there we are. Oh. Get something to look back up back on. <laughs> yeah, but his um, brother is, I think, downstairs eating. <laughs> now. I'm not sure if we've ever asked this question, but where does Nomad come from? Like, where did the idea come from? You know, he's been around for a while now. Um, was he, you know, uh, was the idea from somewhere? Is he drawn from somewhere? Like, uh, Tintin famously drew, or no, Herge famously drew Tintin after his brother and Colonel Sponce after his brother as well. Is there any... Um, you know, like uh, the Nomad, is there anything, any backstory to the Nomad that, you know, that we can know about? Like, where did he come from? Well, he's uh, he's sort of, he's French North African from, uh, mm. uh, probably has some Berber blood as well, but he's, uh, his original character's design was Omar Sharif. No. Oh, okay. oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's 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 evolved a little bit, and uh, I think it's uh, it's a great look that, uh, that Mike has on him. But uh, right, I think I think Paul was the first to draw him, hmm. and uh, yeah. Omar Sharif was the the model. Um, I turned it. Into... <laughs> that's who I was. That's that's who I thought Terry was. Terry Bates. Sorry, what? That, so you cut that? out for a second there, um, uh, Mike. Was that Mike? That? Oh, I said I thought that uh, Terry was using uh, like Timothy Dalton. Uh -huh. okay. I was yeah. in uh, the Rocketeer. Oh uh, yeah. Played... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's a that's a good look. And uh, <laughs> but yeah, he's supposed to be um, mostly French, but uh, raised in North Africa. And um, that's kind of his center of operations. And he has the old uh, the old fort somewhere in uh, Mali, uh, somewhere near Timbuktu. Um, mm. But that's that's his background. And he, he is married to a uh, sub-Saharan African woman, Imara. Mm. Yeah. So are we going to uh -oh. see them again? 
Are we going to see the the mum and and uh, Cardio again? Yes. <laughs> yes. After a, a detour to the Himalayas. Ooh. Ooh. I, I do want to come back to the Himalayas in a moment, but just while we're talking about um, the nomad and the way he's depicted, he's not. I think. Um, when you say the word terrorist, that's not the stereotypical image that, that comes to mind, this, this white Frenchman that's grown up in North Africa. Um, I wanted to ask about the strip from the 29th of October when um, Heloise is in the convenience store buying the glasses and buying the shoes and the owner is watching the news of the capture of the Nomad on television. Um, is the depiction of the, the convenience store owner and the way that he speaks, is that a commentary on stereotypes as well and the way that, uh, that people are drawn uh, and, and seen? Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's a commentary on stereotypes so much as, a, I mean, you know, I suppose it will drive uh, some readers uh, a little over the edge. Mm see a guy uh, with that appearance who uh, thinks the same thing that they do. Was that, you know um, was that scripted, Tony, or was that Mike's depiction? Or uh, No, I think that's in the script, I, I believe. A Southeast Asian uh, man running the store. Or a, uh, I think that's yeah. what you said. I, I think that's that. true. I think, it, I think it is in the script. And, uh, you know, that's the, um, those are the kind of businesses that many new Americans uh, get into. And so that's the, uh, I mean, you wouldn't really expect the guy behind the counter to, uh, you know, be a Harvard MBA, you know, and a wasp. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm sure maybe some readers will take in, will take issue with the fact that this guy thinks terrorism is a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, but that will that will say more about them Damn than it. will about yeah. the strip. Yeah, agreed. Mm. Yeah. Well, One last thing about um, oh sorry, Sikhs and Muslims and Indians moved into my my neighborhood, and I see there's a lot of stores run by uh, people like that. And uh, I mean, I'm very sensitive to that anyway. Um, and even to the 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 Vandar and the depiction of Grand, because you can really easily go over into, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a caricature or make it very racist. Um, uh, and you know, he's a very to me he's a very humorous character, but. With all the characters I draw of the other variety of races, you you don't want it to be uh, a cliche, and um, so I'm very very well aware of that. And I, you know, I know a lot of different people from like different ethnicities that live in my uh, live in live in my neighborhood. So he's just like the the guy that runs a shop down the street from me. So you know. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, um, let, let's go back now to that Himalayas question um, and, and that little uh, <laughs> window that you opened up there. Um, and, and Mike, you've done this too. You, you uh, have posted a picture, uh, I don't know, in sometime in the last week of um, a phantom process and uh, I got the feeling that that might have been set in Tibet or the, in the Himalayas there. Um, we've just seen a story which is very much, um, as, as I've said, focused on the development of Heloise as a character. Are we about to move into the development of Kit Jr. as a character? Is that is that where the next story takes us? Well, <laughs> uh, it, I, I hesitate to say much about that only because it's a, it's a particular kind of story that Falk would occasionally write and I've never attempted it myself. Um, but, uh, you know, probably in, oh gosh, well, six or eight weeks from now, I'd feel more comfortable um, okay. talking about that. But I, I wasn't aware that uh, Mike had some of the, uh, the art up on his, <laughs> his Facebook page. <laughs> but yeah, we are, we are taking a detour into the, uh, to the Himalayas after this. 
uh, and then coming back to this story. And, you know, one of the editorial, uh, you were interested in the editorial process. One of the mm-hmm. changes that uh, King made to the final panel in this, uh, this daily story, uh, I went with the, the line we always use, you know, next, new adventure. Mm-hmm. And they thought that that would drive readers nuts to drop this story where it is. So that's why it says to be continued uh, instead, yeah. of, instead of new adventure. Now it doesn't say it doesn't say when we're going to continue it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the out. <laughs> the only thing uh, the only thing I, can, I feel I can say is that uh, we're not going to be in the Himalayas too awfully long. Okay. Mm. I, was, I was actually wondering that because like this story has gone for about ten months, I think, from a, just a quick little um, look at dates. So, yeah, just wondering how long the next um, adventure would go. Would that be? I think this Sorry? is thirty-eight weeks. This one, the the, yeah. the, uh, the next one won't be thirty-eight weeks. No. <laughs> you you have is it... my interest there, though, Tony, with your your, your statement about. Uh, the next one is a, the type of story that you haven't written before, but was something that Falk did from time to time. Can you can you elaborate more on on what you meant there? Come on, Dan, be surprised when you when you read it. Oh, I just want to, the type of story. It's not, I don't want to know the plot details of the characters. Just the, the, the general type of story. Yeah. Um, well, I'll say it's it, it, it's a it's a formatting issue. That's probably uh, all I can say about it. Okay. In other words, Dan, you're not going to find out, so uh, let's just move on. Uh, I wouldn't earn my paycheck if I didn't ask. <laughs> oh, well, you failed, so you're not getting your paycheck in this, in this week. <laughs> Same as always, Dan. <laughs> um, I noticed oh, that I so... stuff for a while, the art for a while on, this, on the, the process because... Anything I posted would have given away possibly part of the story that we were finishing up now. And what I posted the other day, uh, I try to, if I post something, you just see draw. you don't know the context of what, you see the drawing, but you don't necessarily know the context. Of the mm. Oh, absolutely. So I, I, I hope I wasn't dropping you in that, Mike. Um, that uh, I, I don't at all know anything about the next story other than Kit's in it for a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I just, I just want to, you know, because uh, I know people like to see the, uh, see the process. Yeah. Uh, I just posted, just you know, sort of tease, uh, to tease uh, people or to show them, oh, this, you know, this is what's. Coming. It's just sort of like, um, you know, when you see at the end of an episode, they show you a little bit of the next episode but they don't spoil what's happening in the next yeah. episode it's sort of like to, to, to get people excited about what's coming up hmm. well, yeah. well which image was that mike it was the one of him sitting uh in the shot of the the uh the, uh, the city uh and him sitting there um so uh, you can see it on my my uh, my Facebook uh, my Facebook page, but I never like there were so many cool things that have been cool to show uh, the last one, but I didn't want to show anything where I would ruin uh, what happens mm. with uh, mm. with trees in, in the uh, you know in in, in the city. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I I have pictures I can I can post uh, uh, later on, but uh, I mean one of the reasons I also do it is that. Uh, we have to sort of. It's this is a funny job because you know, and you're sort of like on your own, in a way, when you yeah. work on uh, work on the scripts. Um, you don't have a you don't have a promotional. Well, they have a promotional department, but they don't really promote the adventure scripts very much. Um, so you sort of have to wave your own sort of social media flag. Which is one of the reasons why I, uh, you know, I, I post stuff from uh, the strips from time to time, uh, and also the fact that I know people like seeing, you know, a peek behind the curtain to look at the, uh, to look at the, look at the process. So, uh, um, I think, uh, you know, it's just part of, you know, 
everybody does that now. You know, we just don't have a we don't have a press agent. Hmm. Right. Well, if um, you can probably this goes back to a, a question the guys were asking about Heloise, but if they've seen an image of Kit from the next story, they've probably gathered that uh, some time has passed and uh, they're they're growing up. You know, Kit. Hmm. Kit looks different in this story than you've seen him look before. Um, and, you know, that's, I mean, you, you have to grow them up. I mean, otherwise, yeah. why do they, as Mike says, why do they exist? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm kind of excited about this one. And, and uh, I, think, I think people will enjoy it. Mm. I've, I think... I've just um, scrolled down to the... Um... Uh, to the image I think you're talking about, but I, I was I had a smile on my face. I, I lingered on the um, Warner Brothers, the Bugs Bunny cartoons you had there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit of fun. Um, but and yeah, I can see what you mean by the um, a bit of time that's passed. He seems to have a bit longer hair. He seems a bit more mature in the in the in the face. Just there. Um, well, it looks like he's writing a chronicle from where. I, yeah, make or writing a diary or something like that, or doing his homework. <laughs> It's tough with these characters that are like the Phantom has been 45 for 45 years, right? And the kids were introduced what in the early 80s, so they'd be 45. Yeah. <laughs> now, so it's like uh, uh, I mean we face the same thing with uh, Judge Parker because I actually think those the daughters were introduced in the script right around the same time as the, the kids in. In the Phantom, and so you've gone all through the 80s, all through the 90s, all through the 2000s, and now I don't know what this is, the 2010s or whatever. We've gone, you know, 30 years, um, and you know, so when they were born, no cell phones. Now they're teenagers and their cell phones, and so there's that weird thing you have to do where you have to sort of suspend your belief. Oh, quite a bit, actually, if you think about it, in order for this to actually make any sense whatsoever. Because mm. uh, you had somebody who was born, there was no cell phone, nothing, and now, you know, we have completely modern technology. I mean, one of the things I lament artistically is the loss of the old telephone, because they were much more fun to draw. You could do things <laughs> with props. Everybody walking around with a brick stuck to their head, is just like, in some week. <laughs> Drawing the Phantom and everybody talking on a cell phone and drawing everybody and Judge Parker talking on a cell phone. It's like everybody's got their hand welded to the side of their head. Yeah. <laughs> it's like every panel somebody's talking. Hmm. Well, I just, uh, just this week I shared a uh, Cy Barry image with the boys um, of the Phantom on the phone and he had had to climb a telegraph pole and patch into the wires um, <laughs> in, order to, in order to communicate. So that was probably a bit more fun to draw. Mm. Yeah, in the old days, that's what he would do. He had the he had a, a I think a rotary handset or something. It would <laughs> climb the utility pole to talk to Colonel Warubu. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So you raise a, you raise a good point about the kids' age because I think it was seventy seven they were born. That was, no, that and was when they got married. They were married. So when were they? Was it seventy nine or something? Yeah, seventy nine. The twins were born. Yeah. So what's actually interesting, uh, thanks, Dan. <laughs> They're older than is, me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and they, age, they age naturally because the, I think the twins' yeah, birthday was in 1987. It was actually <laughs> eight years. Yeah. So Lee Falk wrote a story of the eighth, the eighth birthday, which was literally eight years afterwards, and then they stayed eight years oh, for the next, <laughs> next 20 years. Right, and then we had the we had their fifteenth birthday when they were mm. uh, their parents were making plans for their overseas education. Yes, uh, mm. you know, which is kind of uh, again that's just drawing on the on the Falk uh, tradition because the twenty first Phantom went overseas for his education when he was quite a small kid, um, maybe mm. gosh, he was seven or eight or nine, I guess. Um, so I wanted to wait until the kids were a little bit older, and uh, but it seemed inevitable that they have to 
they have to leave the deep woods if they're going to yeah. learn anything about the wider world. So. Yeah, exactly. And because where the 21st Phantom, our Phantom, left when he was 12. And if you read the story, he was supposed to leave at 10, I believe it was. And um, so, you know, he was delayed. And then the twins have been delayed even longer. Right. So, uh, you know, I don't know where they'll, it seems like they will come to another uh, point where they're sort of in stasis for a while, uh, maybe mm. at 17 or 18. Yeah, well, it's definitely a traumatic experience. So I'm sure they're allowed to have a bit of a gap year. Mm. Right. <laughs> 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 is it still important for you, though, Tony, and Jermaine asked earlier about um, killing off the 21st Phantom? And, and, you know, <laughs> obviously, we're not at that stage and we're not going to do that, but is it still important to set the twins yeah. up? Um, and I think this is probably your question, Jermaine, I'm stepping on your toes again, but is it, is it important to, to set up Heloise and Kit as able replacements for the Phantom, even if it never happens? Yeah, I think so. Um, and it kind of goes back to uh, what we were saying before that, uh, you know, if, if they're going to be stuck as children, uh, why, why are they even in the strip? Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, the secession has to uh, at least be set up. And, uh, mm. you know, I, I guess I'm, I guess I want to leave open the possibility that King Features might decide to um, that the 21st Phantom has had his run. I mean, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's entirely impossible. I think it's unlikely, but uh, I wouldn't want to rule it out entirely. So and, do you have a story mapped out, planned in case you get that phone call? <clears throat> you know, you I think on the last podcast there, Jim, I think I, I might've said something about that on the other <laughs> podcast, but, yeah, you know, I think I, I I don't really have the story plotted out, but I've got, I don't know, you know, it's, it's strange when you, like, if people who don't write fiction will might have a hard time um, under understanding this, but every writer will will know how the characters kind of, they tell you things, they speak to you. Um, things become kind of inevitable. And yeah. my, my feeling is that when the 21st Phantom dies, he is not, he, he is, he dies somewhere else yeah. other than uh, Africa. And I think his body doesn't come home. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that's a way to keep him, um, keep him in the strip. I mean, he's out there somewhere but he hasn't been interred in the way that the other 20 phantoms were. Um, and keep a little mystery about his, uh, his demise. Although I think the reader should, should certainly see it and, and shouldn't doubt that he's dead. You know, uh, I mean, it would be an exciting story to write. It would be uh, a really uh, sad story to write. Uh, dif difficult, mm. but um, since we, we have all grown up with him, but, Mm. You know, well, I hope that it's doesn't built happen. into the it's built into the universe that phantoms die. So, yeah, Not, he lasts forever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of that would also be based upon with other things in relationship to script in development, a TV show in development. Um, I think, you know, because the, the, the syndicates are always a little weary of making any big changes yeah. to any of the scripts because um, every time, as I've been told more than once, anytime you make a change, it's an opportunity for some feature editor somewhere to say, eh, you know, it was better when there was the 21st Phantom. Now this 22nd guy, I don't know about that. And, you know, yeah. uh, so there it's, it's, uh, you know, and, and, you know, they like these characters based upon, you know, 
That's why Peter Parker will always be Spider-Man. And even though they always would have Captain America give up being Captain America, they'd always bring him back. Or if you kill off Superman, he's not actually really dead. When yeah. they abandon the trademark, you know the character is really dead. Yeah. Well, it took, what, 40 years for him to marry the Phantom. So, uh, <laughs> so I assume that it's going to take, you know, even longer to... Assisted living skull. <laughs> well, I listened. To, I was reading an uh, an interview with Lee Fork just this week uh, about the wedding, and um, uh, it was one of the comments that he was told by. I can't remember who it was, but they said, you know, you if you're on something that's winning, you don't change it. So that's one of the reasons why he didn't marry the Phantom was because. It worked when he was single, so he didn't marry the, the Diana and the Phantom. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's a big concern at, at King. That, uh, you know, I mean, the, the business is, um, you know, it's so dicey nowadays, anything in media, uh, that it's, you know, why, why risk blowing it up entirely? So um, I think they're going to be pretty conservative about that. Yeah. Mm. Well, just like when they married uh, Lois Lane and Clark Kent, Lois and Superman, you sort of fundamentally changed the mix of that relationship. They ended up getting a lot else out of it, but you also ruined the the tease, the you know the the the, the status quo, um, and. Luckily, in the case of the Phantom, it's you don't have like twenty books, you know, coming out, twenty strips coming out. You only have one, one strip. But I do think that the, like I know with the death of Superman, they basically kind of snuck it by the corporation, and by the time they found out about it, it was too late, and they had already made a lot of money. And then like, oh, okay, yeah, that was a good decision. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I think it, it's much more, uh, the syndicates are much more conservative even than the comic book. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Well, I think we've been, we've been talking about this story for about two hours now. I, didn't, I couldn't believe that we'd be able to get, get this far. Um, <laughs> Well, should, I, should we talk anything about the Sunday story, or no, have we exhausted? Before, no, but before we get to the rat, and and I, <laughs> and I and I hope that we can talk briefly about the rat must die in a moment, Tony, because the that, that story is wrapping up at the at the same time. Um, but the um, one of the things that I particularly loved, and and probably my favourite thing, to be honest, about um, this story was the way that. Uh, look, you, you said that it's been, the synopsis has been out there for three years. Um, this story feels like it's been building for almost a decade because of the way that all of the callbacks that have come back in to this story and um, throughout this story, um, Trail to Gravelines Prison from 2010 is referenced, Shadows of Rune Noble from 2011 is referenced, Battlements of the Nomad we've talked about, that's from 2015, the Twins' Futures from 2015 as well was referenced. In fact, you even reused some of the dialogue from that uh, for, a, for a couple of panels, um, the 20th and 21st of September. Uh, Farewell to the Deep Woods from 2016 was referenced. It's just, this story seems to tie together so many loose ends uh, or, 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 or draw on, you know, the, uh, the threads of those, those other stories. And I really loved the way that um, this just continues to have built the Phantom Universe and, and mm. tied everything together. Um, that, and, and that's probably my single most favourite element of this story. So, uh, you know, that's almost, you know, eight years, I say, and, and you're talking about drafting a year ahead. That's almost a decade now of, of plot that's come together for you in this story. That's, um, are you particularly satisfied with A Reckoning of the Nomad? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, you're right that it has been um, it has been building for a while. But part of the um, and I mean, what you're talking about is the very definition of continuity. I mean, it, it's yeah. uh, you know, you really don't start uh, 
fresh, uh, you know, um, every 26 weeks or whatever. Uh, you know, what came before is always a part of what's coming next. Uh, but, you know, I should, I should just confess right out that um, part of the reason why I do this, why I reference the old stories, and I don't just count on the reader to remember, is that, you know, it is, um, it is a business. And I want to mm. try to I want to try to drive traffic to Comics Kingdom. Like a new reader might see a reference to that previous story and not know anything about it. So I, if I can, uh, you know, help King get some some uh, traffic on the website, I, I want to do that because they're, um, you know, as we've said, that the, the <laughs> business is always hanging by a thread. You know, mm. uh, so it's to everyone's advantage if. Uh, mm if it's doing well, you know. Well, I really appreciate you doing those. I don't tend to go to the Comics Kingdom website. I tend to go to a fruit comic, but um, same sort of deal, except right. different company else. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it's all, it's all good for the Phantom, so. Mm. That's it. Mm. And, Mike, it's sort of a follow-up question for you in that vein, I, and I mentioned the, the repeat of the dialogue on that 2021 of September, and I think I might have even messaged you at the time to say, um, did you try and replicate Paul Ryan's artwork. Do you think that there, would there be a, a moment or an opportunity or, or could this, you know, as an idea, um, if, if Tony writes something like that, where you actually lift the artwork from, from previous and, and take us back not just to the dialogue but to the images that we saw at the time? I think I did do that uh, with a panel uh, that Paul had drawn in the previous story with um, uh, Moans, um, where I actually did use Paul's, uh, and then I sort of redrew it and slightly altered it. In this case, I looked, uh, you know, the one great thing about uh, Tony's always, you know, helps me with reference and sends me reference, which is great. Um, and then he sent me the stuff uh, for the, uh, the stuff that, that Paul had drawn. And then sometimes I will sort of... Hello, Mike? I think you've cut out again, Mike. Oh, bugger. I was about to ask another, uh, another art question as well. <laughs> oh, um, not to worry. Hopefully, Mike will come back again in in a moment. Um, may, may, I think is, is that that? No, I think um, Steve, I might have exhausted my nomad questions now. If you want to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we were talking about Paul. I should say this because, uh, uh, we, well, we were talking about the the sort of banalities of everyday life with the characters uh you know where do they keep their their money where do they keep their phones you know and some of the things that readers are concerned about if <laughs> and i mentioned paul the thing he had with the uh the python's toothbrush mm. Mm. which always always made me laugh it was such fun but in uh, week nine of this nomad story if you notice when the phantom is uh about to creep into the uh, the hut where this body double is is uh, living. Yes. He looks in a window and he sees the guy brushing his teeth, and that was a tip of the hat to my late friend Ryan. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, that, oh, that's nice. So. Yeah, just looking at it now. There we go. <laughs> what was the date, Stephen? Uh, um, the seventeenth of April. Ah, uh, yes. So I was... Tip the hat to Paul Ryan and the great beyond. <laughs> I love uh, it. Sure he had a smile at that. <laughs> Did, uh, was that Mike back online? Yep. Mike is back. Good. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. Uh, could you, did you want to continue? Oh yeah, basically I was just saying that that, this, that uh, whatever I do as far as the angle or whatever, it's always based upon 
whatever the needs of the, the story is. So, um, but it is it is fun to, to go back and see what guys have done before. You know, see what Paul, hmm. Paul did, Dan Barry. Before. Um, I'm very I'm I'm always aware of the fact that uh, you know you're trying to c continue the continuity of what the other artists have done before uh, on the strip. Hmm. It's interesting that you say that, Mike, because, um, and Jermaine and I probably disagree, but um, I thought that the strip on the 8th of November, um, there, there was the, the panel on the right-hand side on the 8th of November was, for me, almost a classic Cy Barry image. Um, just is Jermaine right? He thinks that he not so much. For me, it looks very Cyberry. <laughs> <sighs> well, I'm always um, I'm always uh, like I said. I think when we had talked before, I sort of feel like I'm playing uh, like I'm taking over King Lear or something <laughs> on. Uh, <laughs> Broadway that had been played by, so I sort of feel like I'm 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 sort of doing a Cy Berry esque Phantom, not trying to necessarily copy him per se, okay. but to do I'm very conscious of doing the strip in that sort of vein, in that sort of style. Um, I'm very well aware, I, you know, I do look at his. Uh, He's a hard character to draw, you know. If you draw, you can draw him off a little bit here and there, and he just doesn't have the same. He just won't look right. Mm. Um, and even Barry's work changed quite a bit. If you look at yeah. the beginning, the early '60s to the mid '60s, to what he was doing at the, you know, doing at the end. I know he had other people help draw. He had other people penciling it, where he was inking it. Um, but uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to do my version of what he did because that to me that's the way the character looks. I could draw him in a you know a different any kind of different style, but to me it's sort of like I think of Spider-Man. I think of either John Romita or Gil Kane. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Or, or like when I think of Batman, I tend to think of like Jim Aparo or Neil Adams because that's the stuff that I read and I fell in love with as a kid. So mm -hmm. to me, it's sort of like the, I don't know, the, the style of the strip is sort of a Cyberry style. So I'm very, uh, you know, and it's not like my way of drawing is that far out of the wheelhouse anyway, stylistically. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you ever check out the work that um that Jeff's doing on the Sundays? Pardon? Do you ever we're checking out different artists? Do you ever check out the work that uh, Jeff is doing on the Sunday strip? Oh yeah, no, I think he's doing a great job. I, I think he, he does a, he does a fantastic job, and and uh, you know he's sort of putting his own stamp on it, as it were, and. Um, you know, uh, I think he's doing a, a, a great job. I mean, like I said, this was a hard strip, a hard strip to uh, mm. do. Um, and uh, I think anytime you do a, a strip that's been done, especially a strip, it would be like if, you took, well, if I took over Italian or, you know, Flash Gordon or anything like that that's been around a long time. You know, you have history of that other artists Done it, you know. You always would always be compared to Raymond or to Foster. So, mm. like I said, I always I sort of feel like I'm playing a role, and I want to deliver uh, a performance as an artist that I'm happy with first, because I have to please myself first. But I also want the fans to feel happy and like not suddenly pick up the, the newspaper and go, "Oh my God, what the what the heck happened here? This is this is mm. terrible." Know, and and I have to. I, I'm very happy that most of the people seem to like the job that I, you know, the people get it. Ninety-five percent positive. You know, you're always going to have that one guy that no matter what, 
you know, <laughs> will never be a person to say, ah, I think you left that fingernail off that pinky. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> people that are like that, they count the windows on a jet kind of people, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we all we know people like that all the time. <laughs> ah, so well, Steve, you've opened the the door into the Sundays there, and and we've mentioned that uh, the rat must die. Does this finish on the same weekend? We're, we're talking in the future now, Tony, and and we're very pleased that you've sent us the uh, um, the images for both. D have you wrapped up both of these stories on the same weekend? Uh, it it. Yes, that's true. And again, that's entirely by accident, like the uh, Statue <laughs> of Liberty on the 4th of July. <laughs> so, well, Fru's going to be loving it because they usually put the, 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 the newspaper stories into the Christmas special. So these yeah. have wrapped up just nicely to, to go into the Fru <laughs> Christmas issue. You know, I, I don't know if you've noticed the, uh, the final image that Jeff did on the 28th of October. Mm-hmm which it's just so well done the uh the phantom uh as he's he's lugging the um the rat's body out of uh boomsby prison and he's going out through this secret uh mm. way of access and egress that he has and uh i love the the shadow that yeah that oh, yes. uh it's it's a a shadow that the character in that lighting could not literally cast. Uh, it, so it's a, it's a little bit of poetry, or it's uh, mm. it's more of the figurative reality uh, that he's depicting. But it's a it's a striking image. Mm. Yeah. Now the the fellas were um uh, they were jumping out of their skins when um they they saw mention of the vault of missing men. It totally. Mm. I missed it completely. I've got no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> but they, these two boys on um, on Messenger were just going, he's got the Vault of Missing Men. My, my goodness. I thought, okay, this is something special. So, so where's the Vault of Missing for the For those of us who've come in late, um, <laughs> what is the Vault of Missing Men and why is it so, why are these two fellows just jumping out of their skin at the mere mention of it? Well, that's uh, the, the, the folk story <laughs> that that most recalls is... Um, where the pirate Jean Lafitte is, is um, who is a figure from history and his resting place is unknown. Uh, you know, we find out now that he's, uh, he's in the vault of missing men and uh, that there's a line uh, that the Phantom delivers there that uh, where I, I want to kind of set up some additional stories. I want to bring the vault back. Oh. And, um, uh, so that's why, uh, you know, I think, um, I don't have it in front of me now, but I think the, uh, I think Diana says, this is only the second time I've been in this chamber. Mm. Phantom says, well, there's a lot of stories uh, mm. rooted here. They're all in the Chronicles. I'll tell you about them someday. That's. Oh, uh, you've opened that one up. That's the setup. So, <laughs> uh, we, we will return to the vault. Mm. Do you find it, uh, I asked before about the continuity of, um, I guess, your stories and, and culminating in the Nomad um, capture at the moment. Do you find it easier to, I mean, I suppose it makes sense to, that you find it easier to map the continuity of the stories that you've written over the last, whatever it is, 18, 20 years, um, versus bringing back fork ideas from, and I think Vault of Missing Men is like from 1981, 1982. Um, yeah bringing back those 79 ideas. okay um so <laughs> he's been taking part. notes again Paul part. um <laughs> so is it um is it important to you to to tie in those older fork ideas mm. yes oh always and you know i had a discussion with uh ulf granberg about this um well earlier this year uh, and we kind of shared a couple of ideas on, uh, you know, which stories from the 40s or 50s uh, could be, um, you know, where Falk left some room there to build upon them. Mm. So yes. I, I'd, I'd like to do that in the years ahead. And uh, But, you know, you have to do it in a way where it, it makes complete sense to people yeah. who weren't reading the strip in those days. So mm. that's that's always the trick. Sure. That's always the, uh, a balance you have to try to strike in any event. 
is uh, make you have to serve the longtime reader and the new reader. Mm. I mean, I, I, I hope we're getting new readers. Are we, Mike? I don't know. I, you know, I, I suppose we're probably always uh, getting stuff. In fact, I just talked to somebody at King the other day. I think they do have plans to try to promote uh, the social media aspect of it because uh, not like you're growing new newspaper readers per se, you know. Um, uh, and I do think that you could get more people reading the strips, but they they have to be in their face. I mean, that yeah. again, that's one of the reasons why I promote things so much on my social media, because some people, I was just at a show in, uh, up in uh, Allentown, and there was a gal up there, a lady I met, and she was like, oh, I remember this strip, this was in, you know, she lived in Scranton, that's near Scranton, Pennsylvania, so this, the paper there used to, to carry it. So you do get people that remember it, who might, re might read it again, you might get new people that just bump into it and start reading it. Um, but it has to be, we live in a time where it has to be in people's faces to, to just even yeah. catch it, yep. to even have a chance of poking them. Because as you, you guys know, I mean, you do your podcast, there's things that are flying by you every day you know, with the news cycle and everything going on. It's like your, your social media can almost exhaust you because there's so much flying. Yeah. Well, yeah, they used to talk about the information economy, and now they talk about the attention economy. Yeah. Yep. Microwave generation. <laughs> yeah, and, and I can just like, say that, you know, I, I teach a high school class that gets a student anywhere, say, 14 to 18 or 19, depending on you know, what the problem is. And the students that I get now, different than the students than when I started teaching in the early 2000s. Um, they don't know who Calvin and Hobbes are. They oh. are. <laughs> My local paper is just is, is reprinting them at the moment. They are fantastic. Yeah. Right. But these students, this is everything for them. Everything oh. they consume, 99% of everything they consume comes through this. Through the yeah, so fine. this in some way that they intercept it or see it, maybe they might be interested, but, you know, uh, their brains have been wired not in the way that mine or Tony or you guys were, we were hunter-gatherers, you mm -hmm. found something, <laughs> go out and find, some, you know, in an old bookstore or something, you'd actually physically have to go and look for this thing that you like. Now, you don't physically go. Things are pushed at you. I mean, we read all the time about how the average teenager spends something like five hours a day on YouTube, mm. right? So I would think that maybe teen teachers or any, you know, you've got to start putting stuff where people are just mm. to yeah. have hope of catching. Because I don't think that just because it's a, you know, comic strips are hugely popular. Hugely mm. popular. Format of comic strips. So hugely popular the world over. People love these characters, right? I mean, as the success of the movies prove, people love the characters more than ever before across the world. But the problem you face uh, with a strip is that we have less territory and less push to get yeah. the new to get the new reader, but. I'm doing a, a webtoon on webtoons, a, a, a Korean a website. They're expanding. They're getting people from Marvel and DC is starting to produce stuff. The the uh, uh, kids love reading these web comics, except they read them on their cell phone. So the mm. format is designed from the beginning to be read on the cell phone in the scroll. So I oh, think. Wow. Same thing with the Phantom. Mm. You just have to reformat it to do something where it could be read on the cell phone, and you probably capture a whole new mm. uh, uh, 
era of readers, but it, ha it ha would have to be in a way that was very accessible to them. Because it's mm. not like, but they just got like a lot of other things at them that are already very easy for them to see, mm. designed soon based upon the cell phone. Hmm. Yeah. Well, something as simple as, uh, and I know, Mike, you do post the link to um, the, the Daily Phantom every day. Um, right. But if King Features had a Phantom Facebook page or their own King Features page where they posted the JPEG on um, Facebook every day, uh, I don't know how that would rec uh, how they measure that necessarily, but a lot more people would see it, you know, I, I see your link and most of the time I click on the link if I haven't already seen it through my own, you know, going to see it. But uh, people don't necessarily want to click on the link. It's a, it's a, it, Even that step is, is one too hard. They've got to be able to see it as they scroll past. And in that sense, the, the newspaper strip is perfectly aligned to people's attention span. I, I only want to mm. see one, two, three panels per day and then I'll move on to the next thing and I'll follow the story tomorrow. Um, uh, you would think that there's got to be a business model there somewhere that, that suits today's world and, and, and the mobile format mm. that you're talking about. Well, there's I, lots of... Sorry. You know, from when uh, Brendan, I used to talk to Brendan about it, they are aware of it. I just think it's harder for these media companies to uh, really stay on top of it because yeah. it's driven uh, you have two two forces you have the youth that drive the technology and adopt the early adopters of everything but they don't pay for anything then you have the middle aged people who pay for everything mm. but are not necessarily their early adopters so you have to be aware of the fact that you have that duality going on so like uh, me and my assistant who you uh, interview and I have another assistant, Liang. I'm very well aware of many things because I see them and what they consume, you know, and I'm also on there consuming it. But then you have older people who see, and the young people don't want to pay for it. Like my students, they don't, they don't, they don't want to pay for it. They find amazing ways of getting everything for free. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Everything's better free. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but now you raise a good point, like like with because um, there's there's apps out there that do online comics and uh, and stuff like that where you can actually read the full comic instead of like getting it actually in paper with you know like going to a news agent or a comic book store. Yet there's nothing phantom related where people can get phantom stories, whether they're the new ones that Fru or Egmont produce or or, or past daily and Sunday stories from, you know, Fork and Barry or, or whatever. Um, there's nothing of that. And it's, yeah, there's, there's definitely a, uh, a market that needs, you know, that needs to be captured. So yeah, through Egmont, you need to get yeah, on to it. Yeah, I think if you produced a uh, weekly comic of the Phantom, in the webtoons format that is designed for the cell phone, you would be able to get new readers. I think it would probably have to be a slightly separate continuity. Yeah. Uh, because the other thing is, it's hard for a kid today to relate to somebody rescuing Gemini astronauts. There's a lot of older stuff that's baked in that we accept because we grew up with it. To someone who's ten or twelve, fifteen, <coughs> just can't really relate. So I have the Phantom, but you would probably have to reboot it in a way that would appeal. You know, keep the good parts of it, but you'd have yeah. to reboot it in a way that uh, the younger reader would be able to accept. Is this webtoons.com? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just I'm just looking at it now. Um, I wonder if something like uh, like even like Kid Phantom or uh, even Sweden have got their own version, um, Phantom and Kid, yeah. uh, where that could possibly um, be a good format for something like this. 
I, I mean, I, I, I think so. I mean, you know, the, all the, all the, the, you know, Marvel and DC are preaching the same thing because mm. after, you're going to have to adapt. Either you adapt. It's like, it's like the naps. What happened with Napster, right? The music industry yeah. basically saw this thing come along. Nah, nobody will ever go for that. And then, <laughs> and they've never recovered from that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to to marry a story to a format, to mm. a particular print. I mean, I love print, and I will probably always print, but that's because I grew up with print. You now yeah. have yeah. who grew up loving and reading stuff with this, they may not always have the same affinity for paper or yeah. a book I do. So, um, you know, so I just think that, you know, you could take these same things, reformat them, put them on there, uh, and I think they they would they would be able to to uh, get a whole new readership uh, by doing. And I know that they're they're talking about that, um, mm. but I think the older media have a hard time seeming to adapt it. I know in comics, part of it, the comic book business, I think part of it is that. They don't really like that stuff in a way. It's like they, they prefer paper. They're so wedded to that. But I think that whole generations of kids out there who could read stories about the Phantom. Yeah. yeah. Now you raise a you raise a brilliant point, uh, Mark. I'm looking at that website now. I'll um I'll uh we've all got people that we talk to that are, you know, through an Egmont and stuff like that. So that link will be uh, flying off to them, telling them they need to get onto it. Um, uh, Steve and Dan, do you guys have any uh, final questions? Uh, I don't want to keep everyone for too long. We've been going for about almost mm. two and a half hours now. Do you guys have any final questions? Nah, I'm out of, out of questions. Just <laughs> once again, thank you for... Uh, yeah. For writing such a great story um, in um, in the Nomad and um, providing the, the artwork for it was phenomenal, mm -hmm. Mike. So um, yeah. thank you to both of you very much. Yeah. And I, and I guess I would just say that um, but we, we haven't talked about the rat must die very much and, and, and I think perhaps because that's such a uh, simplistic story and obviously we've got Mike <coughs> on board uh, rather than Jeff, but... Um, both of those, Tony, I've really appreciated your um, efforts on the continuity of the of the fandom, and whether that's all of the um, stories that you've referenced, as as we've talked about with the reckoning of the Nomad, or the incorporate. You know, I feel I feel like I know a lot more about Boomsby Prison, and and uh, when when the Rat and the Phantom were escaping Boomsby Prison, I was thinking, oh, shouldn't they have just taken the same exit as they did in the slave market of Macar? But that was uh, that was bricked up, Dan. Yeah, don't you remember? Right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was bricked it, up at the end. It, it's fair to say that it was a much more complicated tunnel to get out of uh, yeah. Boomsby uh, for the rat. It was, <laughs> and part of it, part of it is uh, inspired by um, the Third Man, Orson Welles, um, the uh, the tunnel scenes. Okay. Where he is, uh, he's escaping in the third man. Uh, I know that Jeff used some of those references uh, in designing the the tunnel. Yeah, okay. Mm. Um, but yeah, certainly between be between finding out more about established um, phantom settings and uh, the regular and constant use of the old jungle sayings and uh, hearkening back to previous stories and that sort of thing, I really love the way that um, you're keeping the phantom verse together. Um, and, and really just building on that continuity the whole time. Yeah. And as someone who is unashamedly um, uh, claims the newspaper strip as uh, the, the, the law of the fandom, I think you're doing a fantastic job of keeping that together and giving me a, a very sound base for an argument whenever I talk to a, a postmodernist <laughs> like Jermaine. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, you no, know, it's right. such, there's such a, a rich... Uh, store of material that Falk left that it's mm. it's pretty irresistible to not uh, uh, I mean you, you have to build on it so yeah yeah exactly um uh, Tony or Mike is there any uh, final comments you guys wanted to um 
uh, to raise or, or, or comment? Uh, well, for me, it's just that uh, I would, you know, the um, <laughs> the nomad is not deceased. Mm. And, uh, neither neither is the python. So uh, Are they going to team up. Well, that's <laughs> that's a possibility. Oh dear. Yeah. Talk about so, a big, uh, uh, a big bite. <laughs> yeah, they are originally rivals. Uh, at one time, the um, the nomad was uh, dropping out of sight because uh, he thought that the um, python would go after him for trying to replace, mm. you know, mm. trying to ba basically uh, supplant the python's leadership once the once the uh, python was out of commission. So there's a rivalry there, but, you know, rivalries uh, have joined forces in the past. Yes, yeah, so my enemy of my... What is it? My yeah. enemy of my enemy is... Or... Yeah. The, en <laughs> the enemy of my enemy. Yeah, yeah the enemy so of... Yeah. They, have, yeah. they do have a very good reason to perhaps join forces. Right. They can't seem to beat the Phantom uh, singly, so maybe <laughs> yeah. they would. Mm. Yeah. Well, um... Sorry, Mark. Oh, I was just saying, you know, and I'm just enjoying uh, uh, drawing the stories myself. So I'm just always as uh, surprised as you guys are when I get the script and I, I go through and I start re I start reading it. So I'm I'm having a I'm having a blast. Uh, awesome. Yeah. No, we we um we we appreciate uh, the sneak peek that you gave us so we can have this discussion. Um, we appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Um, I think uh, you said it well that yeah, you know, you're adding to what Lee Fork has done. Um, so yeah, no, we we appreciate it a lot. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time this morning. Oh. I can see you've got the uh, the cuppa going on in the background there, Tony. Um, yeah, that is. It, it's a it's a a fall New England uh, rainy afternoon, so the, the <laughs> fire is gone. So you knew we were going to talk that long that you had your afternoon tea already when we started <laughs> at 8 a.m. <laughs> um, but no, guys, uh, we, we appreciate um, you joining us. Uh, we would love to do this again, talking about some other stories. Um, uh, it was great. And I hope our listeners enjoyed the insight as well. Well, thanks. It was a pleasure. Indeed. Excellent. Well, no thank, worries. Thank you very, thank much, you very much. Yeah. Thank you.